Okay, so my presentation is called Winning Buy-In. Why? Because buy-in is can be pretty good when you get it from management, isn't it? So, but mastering the art of communication, security to management, because yeah, I think it's an art. We can't put it in numbers so easy. We will talk about numbers later, but it is an art and don't be afraid of it. You will see it is a different language. It is a different, perhaps, culture and stuff like that. But that's okay. Every one of us likes to travel, isn't it? So we go to our different countries, different cultures, different languages by purpose. So don't be afraid of management. Yes, can be a different, but hey, we will hear something about that today. So, as an introduction, my name is Ida Hamete, and why am I standing here? Okay, I like to give talks, so I hope I can help you with stuff, but I do this talk because in my career I had to do a lot of presentations in front of management, in front of board members, sometimes small groups, sometimes big groups, everything you can imagine. And I did a lot of mistakes, <laughs> I did a lot of good things, and I hope I can give you um, advice today, just short advices, but I hope they help you to learn how to do better presentations in front of management, okay? So this is why I am here, but I hope this is not so much about me, but about you and what you learn from it. So in this presentation, I will empower you and your presentation skills, because I believe you will get your management buy-in. And that will change the world, your world, your company, your project team that will just have a lot of influence when you get that buy-in. And I believe in you guys and girls. Sorry. <laughs> so I guess what is your goal in general? It is executive approval. And what is mainly the problem Perhaps you can think back to your own last presentation. It often is that the way people who have a technical background communicate what's normal for them, what's normal in their peer group, in their project teams, perhaps in uh, sister teams, yeah, is not normal, is not understandable, is not within the framing context of management people. They have a different background, they have different ideas, they have a different goal, often. And I, I think this is, uh, this is a problem we should, we should bridge. So my solution is that you should communicate the sec security's value. So, and I especially say value, because that's what management want to hear in management words. So not just the value in your words, but the value which is interesting for management in management words. And you can learn that. That is just practicing, learning. You can learn that. And this is my most important message to you here. So please follow me on the path of Eric. Eric is, let's say, a colleague of mine. And he knew from several other colleagues that presenting it by management in front of the board can be tricky. And you can have so many pitfalls and he is not really willing to, 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 to do the same mistakes. So since he knows there are people who know a bit about presenta presenting, he goes there and let's follow Eric through his presentation. He wants to make an Please don't laugh. Now, I know for the most of you, zero trust is really something normal. Okay? But in German companies, I, I live in Germany, this is not normal. Like, I wouldn't say we are in Stone Age, but there are a lot of companies where you, when you come there and say, we want to do zero trust, and you would say, yeah, they say we already did three quarters of the path, we are already there. No, they look at you, and not only in management, and say, zero trust? What's that? So our Eric, he wants to do a zero trust project, let's say in a German company. And uh, he believes in it. He was on a conference. He heard about it. He thinks this is really great. But 
it will cost money. They need new tools. They need perhaps people for it. They need changes in the company. And that all needs management buy-in. So his boss says, great idea. I love it. But please go to the board and explain them why we need more money. Okay, so Eric prepares. And that is the starting situation of our trip. Is there anybody who can can fill in that? Anybody who had kind of the same situation? Perhaps not with zero trust, since you are probably not all German. But anybody had had experiences with management presentations? Can be tough, but don't have to be. These are no evil creatures or something like this. So the most important part is preparing for your victory. You will not probably, probably do a really good presentation when they tell you, oh, go up there and do it without any preparation. <laughs> I can tell you preparation is everything, really everything when it comes to, let's say you fly to China. You would prepare, wouldn't you? Perhaps you learn some language, perhaps you learn some culture stuff, what you should say or not say, how you say hello, all that stuff. You would prepare. And the same idea, you should really, really prepare your presentation, not just the paper. And we will come to that too. So what are parts of that preparation? The first and most, really most important thing is know your audience. Because you can make an amazing presentation when the audience doesn't understand what you're saying. How can it be? I mean, yeah, it's amazing. You make a show, you, you're funny, you everything. But they don't understand. So really try to find out, and I, I tell you how in some minutes. Try to find out who is your audience? So when you have to present, for example, to the board, who is member of the board? Find that out. Find their names out. Stalk them on LinkedIn. Uh, stalk them on the company website. Uh, try to read articles that they wrote. Try to find everything you can on, find on the internet about these people. So this is the first and easiest thing you could at least uh, uh, know your audience. Perhaps you already have some experience with them. You know how they are when they sleep well and how they are when they do not sleep well. But we come to the next part. Speak their language. So when you know who is in your audience, just then you can begin to find out what's the language they are speaking. Because when they are mainly tech people, you definitely speak a different language than when they're really only people who, who studied management and have no clue you're perhaps in a company which does uh, uh, food, a food company. Perhaps there are people who know really much about food. They are really great. They are great in their job, but they have no idea about app security. Okay? So... When you know your audience, try to find out what is their language. I told you about articles. Read articles they have written. You find out their language. You find out the patterns they use, the words they use. And I know there are so many objections, and I understand the objections against the management, quibberage, buzzword stuff. But I think like that. When I come to Portugal and I try to order something, and I don't speak so much Portuguese. Perhaps I, this coffee, you know, this coffee where you, the coffee runs through and then they just let some water run through the machine, not, not at like Americano. It has a special name in Portuguese. And like you say, uh, see, when I'm trying to explain you what I want from this man up behind the, uh, behind, at the machine to do, these are really many words I'm using now. But in Portuguese, it's just a name and everyone in a bar knows what that is. So the same it is with management buzzwords. They are just words we don't perhaps like because they are like not so... <sighs> they are fuzzy. But for these people, these words have a meaning. It's like you have a reference frame. 
The reference frame of me being German, I lived in the Netherlands for a lot of years, and I know a lot of people here are Dutch, so perhaps you can imagine that. I came there and I thought, can't be so different. I was a bit naive. Because I found out that a lot of cultural things are very different in the Netherlands, and I really had to adjust. So yeah, it's the language, it's culture. Really go into this and let your objections go. <laughs> also, when it feels not so easy in the beginning, the words they are using is their language. So begin to use them as well when you talk to them. When I talk to Germans and I begin to speak Dutch, they think I'm crazy the other way around as well. So just use the language they are using, even though for you it's not the most comfortable one in the beginning. And now build allies. I love this chapter because I'm somebody who I'm not smoking, but you will find me a lot in the smoking corner. Why? Because one of the best places to build allies. There are assistants, there are managers, there are so many people and you can speak to them really easy. I take my coffee and I go there and speak to the people. Because of this habit, I once had to do a presentation and you will see Eric has to do the same. Um, I got to know um, the assistant of our, um, yeah, what was he? He was the uh, C-level of operations and I had to talk to him and I needed to do a presentation. And because I knew her and we were not friends, but we knew each other and there was this spot open because somebody just said, I can't go, this, whatever. His spot was open and she called me and she said, Ida, do you have time in like half an hour? I was here, okay, I will run. And I went to the other building and I managed to get this spot. If I didn't, wouldn't have known her, I was just somebody who wants to do a presentation. Okay, do it over four weeks, do it over six weeks. There's no spot in his calendar. Allies are unbelievable important. So, Management colleagues who know this person or these persons are amazing allies because they can tell you their language, they can tell you their habits, they can tell you so many things you wouldn't imagine are normal, perhaps in this management round. Uh, assistants, great. Other colleagues who already gave speeches to uh, these people. Great, you can learn from their mistakes or not. So what did I advise Eric? Find it out, speak the language, no matter if it feels good in the beginning, and build allies. And yes, he did. So there is something you should always do in the start and we should definitely talk about that now did you re do you remember what i was reading the text in the beginning talking their language means that you do a compression in the beginning and take the people with you so this is what eric does as well what's his framing what was my framing when i started in this presentation so you can use the same since it's a presentation when you are talking about something else in the presentation, like in my project. The people know where you are. Take the people with you. Don't just start with something, an anecdote. Okay, you can do it when it's pre-presentation. But the moment you start, everybody, no matter from where, should be um, sure what this is about. There should be nobody in the audience who after five minutes think, what is this about? Okay? So the first minute you do in your presentation, in their language, in their habits, say what this project is about, just like five words. Don't do more than that. Tell them your intent. 
Why are you there? What is it you want from them? Because it makes a big difference if you just want to tell them a result or you want that they give you buy in or if you want that they free money or whatever. Tell them what you want because the way um, they act later depends on if they understood what you want from them. So tell them early what you want. Short words. And then give them the most in like five words the most important message about your presentation because the, you want them to listen. So what has Eric to do? He frames. I'm, it's about a security project I want to do. Okay. So security project, not more words. Intent. I want to have you buy in for the money and resources we need from this project. Okay? Really clear. And the important message is we, we believe you will become safer and you will earn money. Okay? There are no words about what is zero trust, how zero trust works, whatever. For the people in the room, the most important message in their frame, framing is Safer and you earn money. I believe in return on security invest. So I <laughs> guess that's perhaps my thing, but yeah. So this is what they know and then they can listen and they know why they listen. So the next thing you do is explain why you're doing this. And this will become really important a bit later when we talk about objections. So tell them in their words, in their language, why, what you do and why you're doing this. Share also here your intent for the company. You stand between your problem. It stands between you and your goal. Keep that really short. You do not want to focus on problems. When you focus on problems, your objections later will be huge. So, you can't skip that there is a problem that you don't have the money yet to do the, you don't have the resources yet to do your zero trust. But don't say more than that. It's half sentence, not more. Problems are not the most important thing. The most important thing is the solution. How you want to bridge that gap, but keep it short at that moment. You will probably have uh, have that later in your presentation on bigger scale. But then you start, this is like framing this short um, summary, and then you start in your presentation. And so you start in your presentation with the solution mode. So the people, the audience, will be in a solution mode as well, what will help really, really much when it's about objections. Because if we talk about objections, then we talk about objections with a solution and not with a problem. Makes a big difference. So, wait. My thing stole the compelling story and now I, you see, Preparation. I was too fast with that because I'm not used to this thing. Um, did I tell you about the tech check thing? Some of you I did tell. One of my, one really important thing is do a tech check. And I have not had one of these. So I definitely advise Eric to use his own and test it so he's not too fast. Um, you should tell a compelling narrative. Why? Because people are made to follow stories. When we were in Stone Age and we sit at the fire, we tell each other stories. These stories are like in our genes. There are some stories like you will see the hero story. Eric in the beginning does not get a quest. He does not know how to do it. He's a bit afraid. Then he finds somebody who can tell him something, how it becomes better. And then you will see how it goes on. But there are certain stories which we are really, really, really deep in our human beings. Tell a story. 
okay, that sounds a bit crazy when you're about technical things and numbers, but yes, it is possible. And it will drag that people in the story. They will follow. And when they follow, we're the hero, your solution. They will be, yes, that's a great solution because your hero, he did it. They are in a different psychological mode. So it is a really good trick to tell a story. And in this story, they bond to the character. By bonding to the character, they want to have the same solution, which worked in your story. They will have much less objections. And to be honest, all we do here is take care that there will be not too many objections that break you in the end. So tell a story. I'm not using a lot of visuals. You will not see any visual in my slides. Why? Because I want that you listen to me. I don't want to have a lot of text on here because otherwise you're reading. And the only thing you're doing is reading because human beings, mainly when they see something, they kind of have to read it. So the more text is on your slides, the less they listen to you. And when you want something in your presentation to be able to get your zero trust or whatever project, you want them to listen, not to read. So don't put more words on here than any needed. And better you prepare kind of a, a, a paper for later. If it's, if it's needed that they give it around or look at, have a second look, give them a, a, a full paper with all um, explanations and everything afterwards, never before. Then you give it before, they will read the whole time. <laughs> so you don't want them to read. If you have numbers, and that will be uh, now a difficult topic because you are used to have a lot of numbers. We had that a bit in the beginning already. Management people are used to have a lot of numbers too, but different kind of numbers. So there are two, two problems. First of all, they probably don't understand your numbers and they can't place them. So if you need numbers, and for the most presentation, you will need some numbers, always put a reference in there. So with my example with Germany and the Netherlands or Portugal or whatever, different languages, different cultures, take a reference they understand. And um, something like uh, what a different company did or how big a different company is or a lot of people know something in their country, how big something is, or to compare stuff with each other. When you say it's like a, a fly in this room, you would think, oh, this is pretty small. But when I just said one centimeter or, I don't know, different kind of thing, you would think, a fly is smaller. What, what are you telling me? Always comp make a comparison, always make a framing so they can understand numbers. Never just put there a number. Will not help. It will kill your presentation. When you need graphics, just put them there the moment you begin to explain them. So my small uh, clicker thing, don't <laughs> really test before. Because the moment you put a graphic on there, they will begin in their heads to interpret this graphic. And probably they will have a wrong interpretation or they can have a wrong interpretation. You will never get that out of their head again. So when you put on a graphic, just do it at the moment you begin to explain it. And then also with the references. Yeah. It's, they know some, in, in, in management, they know some certain graphs. Even if you explain this is a different kind of graph, it just looks a bit like that or you don't even know that. They will interpret it in their language, in their frame. So be really sure that whatever you tell there is extremely clear in the management language. Otherwise, they do their interpretation and they judge on their interpretation and they have their objections on their interpretation. So and now comes my frame and summary. What was I skipped that? <laughs> so... Um, you always start with framing and summary to have the people on place. So tell a story. Our Eric tells the story of the hero who did in another company a zero trust implementation 
And he tells about this guy who was successful with the zero trust implementation. And he was especially good in what? Management numbers. So the management numbers in the end did fit because that is what your management want to hear. That the, um, I don't know, that you have less CVEs. That's nice. But they will say, and what shall we do with that? Then we have less CVE, so yeah. No. Tell them that the other company, or Eric tells them that the other companies became better in management numbers because of the project. So can be ROI, it can be whatever. There are so many management numbers. We have to look at the certain project to, to find out what is it, is it, it is for you. It can be hiring numbers. It can be headcount, but always numbers they understand and they have in their plans, in their business plans. So you fit with your project to their business plans, not the other way around. They will not change their business plans to fit your project normally. You fit their business plans. Um, so with visuals, he will do really not much and only the ones which are really needed to have them listen to what he talks. Framing summary, we just already went through. Uh, and yeah, preparing for battle. So this is not done just by making slides. Till now, we just spoke about making getting allies, so to know, have knowledge how to do the slides, know what the business uh, needs are to do the slides, but we did not speak about one thing that can make or break your presentation. And this is the question and answers you get. So what you really always want to prepare is any kind of questions, especially management kind questions, and address, you want to address objections. You want to think about all the kind of objections they could have against your project. Because when you know these objections, when you know the questions, you will be prepared for the question and answer section. And it is normally not your presentation that breaks your buy-in. It will be question and answers. We come to this part later, but you will definitely um, have to, to anticipate questions. So what is it for Eric? Questions that Eric can think of are, what is zero trust? Yeah, he has to give some explanation. Um, where does that come from? What does that have to do with our company? How can we make money with it? Yeah, of course, he already explained that in his slides, but perhaps it will come again. So make a list of questions, typical management question. Get your allies, help you. The allies probably know what kind of questions they will do and address objections. The most objections will be around change because all projects are change and people don't like change most of the time. So um, I will tell you more about uh, the kind of objection that will come, but definitely go through every kind of objection you can think of before because you can use them. The next part is a bit unfair because, of course, when you often do this kind of presentations, you are prepared, you know what you're doing, you're standing there, you have no problem. But you have to start somewhere. And that somewhere will be your friends, your family, your colleagues. Think of a presentation like a theater play. Is there any theater player except in, uh, in impro theater who does not work on his text and has the text in his hat? No, is it? So when you're doing presentations, have your text in your hat. And that especially is when you're not so used to speak. So you saw how... The, the slides got me out of my, my flow when there were kind of that one was missing. That shouldn't happen. Yeah. You have your flow. You think about your flow like a hundred times, 200 times. When you're not 
the less experienced and the less assertive person you are, the more really learn every word. This is not bad. I mean, you should not stand there like it's in theater and the third grade, and then you... That's not the idea. But it's really okay when you know every word of the presentation you want to give. This is really okay. And the more experienced you get, the less... um much you have to really learn every word but somebody should be able to make you awake in the night and you can tell him what your presentation is about and you know all the slides and you know the order of the slides and you know what's on your slides and you know what you want to have the people do in the end okay this is the grade of preparation you need and do that with friends. Really go there. Make yourself a stage. Stand on the kitchen table. I don't know. Don't feel too silly and don't fall off. But really prepare. Train with co uh, colleagues. Yeah. Really make a kind of boardroom if you have the possibility. And train that because it will help you so much when it is not the first or the second time you give the presentation, but the, the 20th time you give this presentation is in front of board. That's normal then. You already did that so often. But that gives you confidence that you can do it. And when there is anything that kills the vibe they have against you, then it is that they feel you don't have confidence. You're not standing there. Okay? So this is really important. Build confidence and practice. Confidence is also that you know them. You know the first slide where I said, know your, uh, know your uh, audience. That will help to build confidence when you know who is sitting there, how they think, how they do things, what's important for them. When you know your, the objections, you go in there in a totally different, different way. So yeah, what does Eric do in this situation? I guess he's really preparing. He's really doing this over and over and over again. But there's one thing I have to tell you. When you communi uh, communicate a shared intent very early in your presentation, the goal, which was in this summary, is already a part of it. When you think they are, it will be very hard on objections. Go further here. Really take away their fear with your words. Tell them that you're not an enemy. You don't want to cost them money. You want to give them money. Okay? Or give them money, but have them make money. Take away their fears very early. The earlier in your speech you take away the fears and you address objections, you will disarm them. Because an objection you already said out loud in your presentation will be much harder for them to do in the end. Because they know you know the objection. Okay? Don't make a big list of objections and put them all in there. It will be a bit boring. But when there are some really often sad objections from your allies, they, th they say they always say, but we don't have the money. Then you say here, we all want to have more secure software. We all want to have our company thrive. And we, I know that we are short on money at the moment, but we all want to make money. And this project is to make money. That is what Eric could say in the moment when his company is short in money. So you already take away that objection and make it in your own, uh, in your, in, positive for you. And one other thing. Who in this room can see what's different on me than two hours ago? Any? What changed? My dress and my shoes, actually. <laughs> So, dressing, like uh, everything else, like language, like culture, is unbelievably important. I know that a lot of people wish it would not be like that. But if you go there and you want to fit in because you want that they listen to you and not look the whole time on your clothes and think, what is he or she doing here? Yeah? 
dress the same way they do dress. So when your board is in business casual, dress in business casual. When they are in business formal, yes, do business formal. When they all sit there in hoodies, please don't stand there in business formal. So it goes both ways, really. Dress the same kind of way they do. And if you are not comfortable yet with that kind of clothes, and you have enough time to prepare, and I hope that because you need to prepare your slides as well, begin to wear that kind of cloth at home, but also on, on your workplace. And yes, the colleagues will laugh in the beginning, but when you explain them why it is important, <laughs> they will also, oh yeah, you're, so you're helping our project when you're doing that. Okay, I guess they will, hope it will be okay. They will be understanding. And after a while, it will feel normal for you. We have a word in German, it's called Lackaffe. So when you feel like a Lackaffe in front of the board, they will feel it and you will be embarrassed without having to be embarrassed. So preparing also with your dress is really important. You want to stand there, you would want to really feel good. And that also includes clothes. So yeah, presentation, it's there. Perhaps the assistant called, perhaps it's your normal scheduled appointment. Uh, there are two people or 20. Doesn't matter, you're prepared. Eric can stand there and he knows what he's doing. He knows the objections. He knows the question. He knows what he's saying and he translated everything in management talk. So what else is important? Stand grounded. When you're like this on stage, it can be a bit tricky. When you, oh yeah, and take care with the cables. So really stand grounded. I'm used to that kind of shoe, so it's okay for me. When you're not, please really train. For man, it's a bit easier. But, and you don't have to wear high heels. I do it on just 160. It's easier, I think, with presentations. But really stay grounded. Whatever you do, stand there. It's your presentation. And nobody else should take that away from you. Breathe. A lot of people start to breathe really shallow when they are in fear or it, are afraid, breathe through your belly, okay? I'm also in a former life, I was a physiotherapist, so I know about some things about belly breathing. It really calms down your whole organism. So just stand there. It doesn't matter. They are talking about their own stuff. Just stand there for a short moment, really grounded and breathe, and it will change your presentation because you're there. You're standing. Believe in yourself. The moment you do not believe in yourself, they will not believe in you. So yeah, that's what Eric is doing. He's really standing there. He's feeling comfortable in his clothes. He knows he's prepared for everything what's coming. And the presentation can go. And it goes. And it is in the right words. And it has the numbers they understand. And the numbers are framed so they can place them. So, comes the worst part, Q&A session. Sometimes it's not, but most of the time it is. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Huh? what happened? Oh, no, 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 sorry. I'm sorry. The huh? Q&A session. Uh, <laughs> that, that's really good. Sorry. Uh, so, what do you need for a Q&A session? You need to be aware of death by delay because telling, oh yeah, let's do that the next time is the most easy thing to get rid of good ideas. Just kill them. Board members or other management people are extremely good in that. It's just a fear thing. It's, it's normal. We all have our objections. Everybody has them. Death by delay is one of them. I'll tell you in the next slide how to deal with that. Never change is another one. You know that? Never change a winning team? They will definitely say, we are all good. Death by detail. They ask for so many details which are not important at that moment that you're in discussions and everything's killed. And killed by old experience. I know a company where they did that and it failed. Yeah, that's nice, but we are not that company. So how do you deal with these things? Listen and watch well. You should know your presentation so well out of your head that you can 
look at all the people and you see their faces, especially also when in Q&A session. Always be respectful. The moment you lose your respect, no matter what they are saying, you lost. Okay? Always stay really respectful for their questions, their objections, because they will feel, and then it becomes like a struggle, like an enemy thing. No. Stay respectful and answer their questions. But stick to your goal. When they say too many details, you say, but that is not for now. I will answer you that in the, while the project is running. Stick to your goal. Whatever you're doing, the change is good. The change is okay. Your company is not the most special, but also not the most general company. Stick to your goal and stand your ground. No matter what there happens, stand your ground. You want this project? Stand to it. Don't let you go with some objections of other people. You want that? You have to stay on getting it now. Not over three weeks, not over 10 months, not after the next working group who works out details. Now. And stand in for that. So, Eric has success. Yeah! Great! Because he went through this hell. Okay? It was horrible for him, but he got his project. Because he went through Q&A, he answered all the questions with respect, and in their language. And they understood, okay, we can have a return on investment, so why not do it? Happy end? Yeah. So, what's my summary? I guess it's understand your audience, because that's where it's beginning. Understand your audience. And my lessons learned from all that time is have the best allies. <laughs> that really makes a change. And you, all of you can do that. Everybody can have a coffee. Everybody can have a small talk. Everybody can give a cake or flowers or whatever to an assistant, but not so obvious. Just do it nice. <laughs> so when you know your audience and you have your allies, it will work. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, so, uh, your oh, no, slides no, no. tricked me. <laughs> QA is QA, you know? Uh, <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> now you can do it. All right, thanks, Ida. Um, I have a question on how do you spin the story. So I think mm -hmm. you, you mentioned something about return on investment. You also mentioned taking their fears away, which is a little bit of a surprise because I would try to work on those fears. Tell them if you don't do this, bad things might happen. Which, how would you but spin it? And the third one is others are doing it. So these would be the three angles. How would you spin it? Or you could also combine the three. Huh? Mm -hmm. And especially how do you make, I mean, how do you express the return on investment in numbers? Like you invest a million dollars and you're going to make three. Ideally, if you could show that, it's mm -hmm. almost would be guaranteed. I yes. would expect. Thank yes. You. Definitely. So with taking away the fears, it is not the, f the, okay, we're in security context, you sometimes use fears to make people move. I would never recommend that because moving from fears makes people do strange things just to get rid of the fear, not to, uh, to get, go somewhere. But with that fears, I mean, uh, the fear of change, for example. So yeah, you can play with the fears, but I would never, Recommend it as the main reason to do something. The main reason should always be a positive thing. Uh, with the return on investment, it really depends on the, the, the management goals of the company. So some want to cut on, on headcount. Others uh, want to, I don't know, uh, get a product on the street uh, and have a different m pro a position to differentiate each other. Um, others, uh, it really depends on the business goals, but you should go with the business goals they do have and then calculate what the, your project makes for this business goals. Uh, if it's cutback, if it's uh, product so selling products, whatever it is. For example, uh, I worked for a telecommunication company there. It mainly was um, 
uh, cutting back on the time the uh, operators are on phone with customers, still having a good customer support, but having less time with them because we had millions of calls. So this would be then a number that you say, okay, when I do this security, uh, I don't need uh, to have the cost, the, the, um, the person on the phone asked the customer all that questions because I, 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 I did that before in an automated way, in a secure automated way. It's more secure and you save time between the operator and the customer. And this is the number they want to see, the save time. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question about buzzwords. Mm -hmm. um, the assumption I think here was that if you are a like a technical person uh, giving an overview of a project, uh, you need to speak their language. And the assumption here is that then I will understand what management is saying. I'll understand <coughs> the buzzwords. But the problem is I don't. So a good example from back 15 years back is everybody started to use the word cyber. Mm -hmm. And the whole community was really confused. Like I've been in doing InfoSec my whole life. Uh, I'm in data security. I'm in privacy. What the hell is the management now talking about cyber? What does it actually mean? And you can't ask because you're this infosec person who's known to be incredibly smart. You understand incredibly complex systems, uh, and you're also a very straightforward person. Yes. So, and and if you challenge uh, manager Bob, uh, what the hell do you mean when you say cyber? It's not a very Yes, Good definitely. Um, and then I, I actually, sorry, yeah. follow up. Yeah, just, yeah. I'm, I'm so agitated about this question. Currently, I'm struggling with the word operas, operationalization. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't even Google that because if you Google that, then it just gives you tons of answers. And I have no idea what Bob is actually uh, saying when the manager is talking about that we need to focus on operationalization. Mm -hmm. So I would say there are two, uh, two possibilities or you ask an ally which you know from your coffee talks where you know you can ask that person that. That's what I mainly do. So I, I think, yeah, I don't have to know everything and I don't ask Bob, of course not. But I do perhaps ask a colleague of Bob, which I know, and I know I can ask. It's the best, best possibility. The other possibility is go to papers your company is writing, internal or external, and, uh, and read them. And often there is not really an explanation, but you know in which context they use it, so you at least know their framing of the word. Yeah, that are the best uh, possibilities to, to find out what your company means with that buzzword. And so there are also CEOs who make up buzzwords. They are really good at that, especially when the numbers are bad. So when they're bad, the company is not in a good shape and they make up buzzwords as crazy. Yeah. But you don't have to use every buzzword. It's more that use the, the words or which are really common in management. Because they just, it's easier, like I say, to use one word than 10 sentences. Or which are really known in your language of the company. Often it, the short things, uh, or, yeah, but that your, your friend at the coffee machine can tell you that, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Last question. I, uh, thanks. Uh, you, you mentioned, um, you want to talk a little bit about these, uh, things like um, <laughs> death by delay <Yes. laughs> never changed. So I think they were super interesting. The death by delay is something very favorite tactic yes. of uh, some managers. <laughs> hmm? It would be great if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, what oh, would yeah. be your strategies? To uh, yes. So the I would say the most uh, the most common strategy really is to tell them that you need the answer the answer now you in the in this small summary in the beginning you already said you want uh, the answer and you say that you can answer the other questions which make the delay especially when it's about details you can do that later let me start now i will give you that answers later i can come back with some in between uh, um uh, numbers for you if you want, but let me start now and stand your ground in that. There's also death by delay where they say we can't do that now because we have other <coughs> projects, other possibility of death by delay. Um, then you can tell them that they are earning money. They will earn money with that if you have the right numbers or they will save money. 
So you say, then let us get other people, other resources in when that's needed. So really stand your ground, no matter what they do, always stand your ground and always be respectful because tell them you understand that. The first thing is always refrain what they were saying and say that you understand that or that you can feel with it or that you, you, you see that and then stand your ground. You want that now and there are always possibilities to do it now, even though the, you don't say your objection is crazy. Yeah. Thank you, Ida. Um, let's wrap up and uh, please give her another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.